Fatima uh, Kanjar um, here, um, who is our inclusivity uh, champion. Um, and we've invited Fatima to sort of join our, our board today uh, to um, sort of ha have a look at sort of how we do and, and to make sure that the public and private sector are involved collectively in, in the work of the inclusivity champion. So thank you very much um, for joining Fatima. Um, I'd also like to welcome Barney, Hello, Barney. Um, Barney, um, if you remember, colleagues, um, for the business rep groups, they meet outside of the LEP board, and together they elect uh, one of them to join us for a period of 12 months. Um, that changeover happens in June, and so Barney is taking over as business rep groups uh, rep on the LEP board um, from Becky Hart um, of the CBI. So I want to welcome Barney and, and thank you in advance for your contributions. I also want to formally recognise the contributions that Becky Hart has made um, over the last um, few, few years indeed um, and appreciating the um, challenges uh, that the organisation she works for has, has gone through. Um, she is doing her bits with, with our region and we look forward to her being part of the uh, business rep groups um, with the CBI um, going forwards but Barney will be, um, be, be joining here. And I think the other um, sort of, I, I guess, nod I wanted to make was obviously Councillor Scullion has, has moved from uh, deputy leader to leader, and we just want to welcome you in your new capacity, <laughs> Jane, to, to, to the board. Um, I, I think I should also just mention, um, and I think everyone is aware of my own uh, personal announcement to step down as, as chair um, of the LEP board, and also from the committees of the Combined Authority at the end of this month. Um, so I, I don't want to you know, make a, a big uh, opening remark, but I do just want to say it's been a real privilege um, to be part of, of this group. I, I sort of joined the, the LEP in 2017, um, which is a good while ago now, um, and I am really proud to have played, you know, my small contribution to, you know, the growth deal, to some of the decision committees, and, and also to integration of the LEP um, over the last year. So um, thank you to everyone who sent some really lovely messages um, after my announcement went out. For those who didn't send me a message, well... <laughs> still time. <laughs> there is still time until the end of June. <laughs> um, so t turning to the um, meeting today... Um, I just wanted to flag, we've, we've actually got some really important topics on there. We've got the economic strategy, uh, we're talking about investment zones, and also the, the West Yorkshire plan. Um, and I think, you know, those topics can make a really material difference to, you know, the prosperity of, of this region, but also to businesses within this region. So I, I want to make sure that we give the, the right focus to that. And, and I'm very conscious that because of delays with the LEP integration, we are quite thin on the ground um, of some of our private sector colleagues. And I know we're going to be addressing that head on in the, uh, the LEP evolution paper in, in item six, but it's so important that we keep that public and private sector input working to, together on this. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, in terms of the agenda, I don't think we'll need the full allocated time until five o'clock. I'm hoping for a four o'clock or maybe just after finish. Um, so hopefully we can we can proceed like that. So um, that was my um, sort of remarks. Miles, could we just move on to any apologies for absence today, which I think there's going to be a few. Apologies for absence have been received from Professor Shirley Congdon, Councillor Claire Douglas, Councillor Peter Mucklow, Cameron Rashid, Mandy Ridyard and Colly Therai. Thank you very much, Miles. Um, and then can I just check item two, any declarations of interest that we need to make on any items for the agenda today? I don't see any. Um, and then there's, there's nothing um, in this paper for exclusion of the press and public, so everything will be held um, in public. And so as that, can I just confirm that we are starting the recording, Miles? And, and as Miles is confirming that, can I also then just say it'd be really helpful if we could use the microphones um, on the table. So for those who it's first meeting, it's, it's the button with the uh, sort of the speaking uh, voice, Barney, um, as, as demonstrated by Esma. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we started. We're, we've started. So we're, we're now in, in live session. So then turning to um, item four, um, the minutes of the meeting that we had of the LEP board uh, back in March, uh, on the 8th of March. Um, we've got quite a comprehensive set of minutes um, there. Um, I have reviewed them. I know Ben has reviewed them as well. But are there any comments um, on the minutes from that meeting? I'm going to take that as um, violent agreements with them. Um, and so I'll, I'll sign those um, after the meeting, but we'll take those minutes as confirmed. So if I can then um, move to item five, um, and, and Tracy, maybe you provide a, a mayor's update for, for the board. Thank you. 
Indeed, and thank you everybody for coming. It's always a pleasure to be here at the LEP board. Um, so just a, a few items on my uh, updates. The West Yorkshire plan, um, which we're going, is actually an agenda item, so we'll be going into more detail on that. But this has been um, a fantastic collaboration, um, cooperation, and um, bringing five leaders, five missions for a brighter West Yorkshire that works for all, I think has put us in a really good place um, uh, in lockstep across the region to deliver um, our five missions for West Yorkshire and gives us a real direction of travel for 2040, uh, turbocharging our plans and giving real clarity across the whole region, how we can work collectively for better outcomes. So that's really exciting and please, as many as possible, uh, do join us uh, at 10 o'clock on Friday at the Corn Exchange where we'll be celebrating the good work that's gone on. Um, Okie doke, uh, moving on to buses. Um, the decision was made at the last combined authority that franchising is our preferred option. Um, there will then be an audit and then public consultation. And um, <clears throat> I met with officers this week to discuss the scale and the scope of that consultation. That's going to be out in the autumn um, and then a March decision next year. Also, we allocated £7 million to enhance uh, the routes that will reconnect some of our communities because for me, this is why bus is so important. When 80% of the, of, of the public who use public transport use buses, far too many communities have been completely isolated by these uh, bus cuts. Um, can I say that Councillor Hinchcliffe led the discussion with transport colleagues for the next stage of funding, so I want to thank uh, Councillor Hinchcliffe for her leadership on that. And it might be uh, just for uh, noting that first announced um, increased profits on their bus operations over last year, even though the routes have been reduced across the region. So it is worth bearing in mind that bus companies are still making a profit whilst public are struggling to get on a bus. So I'll be picking that up with them in a very robust fashion next time we meet. Um, you may have also seen that Trans Pennine Express, a company that has failed our region year in, year out, has um, finally, well, it, it was a failing company and it didn't get a new contract. I did think government were actually going to extend the contract as they have done with Avanti for six months to give them a bit of breathing space. So I was really pleased that after a campaign led by us and the mayors, that government really understood. We were very clear to give TransPennine a, a, a new contract, we'll be letting down the north. And I'm so glad that they heard what we had to say. And they are, they are now in Operator of Last Resort. And I met with Operator of Last Resort um, uh, last week, and they were talking us through uh, their plans and then they also presented at Rail North Committee and I'm really hopeful of stabilisation of the routes. Um, uh, their deadline, uh, they were telling us, is the 21st of June where we will see some stabilisation and then improvements into the autumn. And goodness me, it could not come soon enough, could it? Because businesses everywhere I went said, if you can sort out transport, I can recruit. I can be more profitable, I can be more productive. It's so important for our economy across the region. So um, just to uh, international engagement, um, we had a really productive trip to Ireland to see their mass transit and to learn lessons from them on bus. Also, we had an opportunity to talk to their culture minister as well. That was really um, uh, uh, fruitful and hopefully will benefit businesses here in West Yorkshire and also improve opportunities for export. Uh, I met with the Japanese ambassador who had a really great um, series of meetings here in Leeds as well. And the German ambassador is uh, also uh, meeting us this week, I think, uh, uh, towards the end of the week. And the French ambassador has reached out to have a meeting as well. And we might have left Europe, but we are still Europeans and we're still going to be doing all we can to make it easy for business to trade in Europe and to um, uh, embrace um, uh, Europeans to come to our region as well. So uh, that's all good news. Uh, for those also who have 
uh, had uh, any interest in Leeds 2023, and I'm sure Tom would second me on this, that the Wow Barn, uh, which was funded by us, was a hugely successful and has led to an uptick in women uh, being interested in going into construction and plumbing, which can only be a good thing, can't it? And also, I was very worried about the sustainability of the Wow Barn, and it has now found a home um, at a farm where it's going to be an outdoor classroom. So that's good news. Um, the last couple of points, UK Reef was a huge success, 7,500 people. Can I thank my Leeds colleagues for bringing the sunshine for the second UK Reef on the trot. So how do we do this? Um, and to have real estate and developers talking so positively and investors about our region was really um, exciting and just underscores my commitment to public-private engagement. Our ambitions will not be possible without the uh, private sector. So thank you to them. Um, and finally, um, we're, we're definitely going to move on to the evolution of the LEP, but I just wanted to say how, how excited I am about a deepening relationship with ourselves, um, my office, and um, business. And I think, and I hope that your, the skills of business will be really enhanced and supported and elevated um, with this new relationship. And I'd just like to add my thanks as well to the great stewardship for the last year uh, of, as interim and an amazing uh, uh, contribution that is not um, uh, unnoted. So thank you so much. So we will continue to empower and embed our relationship with the private sector. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much. Mayor. Um, and, and are there any questions um, for the Mayor on, on that update? Um, certainly, I think the weather at UK Reef, I mean, it's getting boring now, isn't it, with so much sunshine in Leeds, but I thought UK Reef was a, an outstanding event and, and a really great time where we did see so many people within this you know, business community and, and sort of our politicians coming together and, and putting a great, a great show on, and hopefully the contacts and the meetings that will happen after that will, will make that business case um, really work. Okay, if we then move to item um, number six on LEP uh, evolution, I'm, I'm going to pass to Alan um, for most of this, but there's the key points here, this covers um, an update on recruitment and membership of the board. Um, it covers the appointments to some of the various roles within this board. Um, roles to other uh, bodies are going to be covered by um, paper number seven. Um, and then it also asks for some views on the future arrangements for this board um, and, and conversation, which I'll do there. So, Alan, can I please pass to you to, to lead us through it? Great. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, if I could, become, before coming on to the, um, the detail around the appointments and so on, if I could just um, say a few words by way of, of context, and in particular refer to the letter that's attached to Appendix 2, because I think this is a really important um, place to start with what we're trying to um, achieve. So you know, in West Yorkshire, we've had a really strong history, uh, proud history of partnership between the private and public sector um, and a collective shared endeavor to create a fairer, more prosperous, more sustainable um, society. And the Leeds City Region, LEP, was successful in delivering the largest growth deal in the country. So we are building on some really strong foundations. Um, at the spring, as, as colleagues will be aware, LEPs have been under review for a couple of years, and that's taken some time for um, the conclusions to be reached. And the, um, and the government announced in spring budget this year that from 2024, they would no longer be um, supported nationally. Now, in our region, what that means really is completing the process that's already been underway to bring the LEP and the mayoral combined authority together and integrate the LEP fully into the mayoral combined authority um, because it's recognized amongst everybody that strong partnership between the public and private sectors is absolutely crucial um, and must um, continue. And indeed, the model that we have got um, here is held up nationally as a model of good practice. So we, um, we need to build on that and any changes that should happen um, should not uh, take away from, from that progress that we've made. Um, and so um, what that means is that the intention is absolutely for the private sector to remain represented on the decision-making committees of the combined authority and to have a strong voice uh, within the combined authority and for it to remain a fundamental partner 
in delivery. And I think it's worth just 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 um, also saying thank you to every member of the private sector who's given up their time freely to contribute towards the work of the Merrill Combined Authority. And we know that you know nationally there were there was a degree of concern um, that the government's uh, announcement was met with. And so uh, really important to emphasize that the, the partnership between the private and public sector uh, here must um, deepen. So um, that all of that said, we're in a period of transition. Um, we know that there is, uh, Mark, Mark, you've announced your intention to step down. We have a number of vacancies across the board that we need to fill. So we're now in a period where we need to, um, with that ambition in mind, we need to get through the next period and move forward. So what this um, paper is asking for, um, and I'm just going to run through for clarity for e each of the various elements, if you'll, if you'll um, bear with me. So the first is um, formally needing to approve the membership um, of the, uh, the council representatives, and they're set out Appendix 1. The second is that the term of office of three of our members, that's um, Shirley, uh, Cameron, and Cully, need to be extended for a further three-year term, so it's asking for that to be confirmed. It's noting that recruitment for additional members, um, and we now have seven vacancies, is underway, and the aim is to complete that by um, the summer. Um, I'll note that at 2.16, there's a line which um, says that there's a panel to be convened with private and public sector representation, um, but the board is asked to delegate authority to the mayor and chief executive to make the appointments. To be completely clear about that, that's so that we don't have to wait for the next meeting of the board in order for appointments to be made. So a panel will meet, which is jointly between the private and public sector, and then formally speaking, the, the, the decision to appoint is delegated to the mayor and the chief exec. In practice, what will happen is the proposal for appointments will be circulated to the board for views. Um, then, I, in terms of the, uh, the chair, the ad advertisement for that is live with a deadline of the 30th of June. The proposal here is that with the with Mark standing down, there is also a vacancy for deputy chair, and the proposal there is that the mayor would make an appointment following the appointment of the chair. So there would be no deputy chair for the um, for the next period. Two twenty, two twenty one, and two twenty two. I'm going to come back. With, I'm going to come back to in just a moment. So at two twenty three. There's a proposal around co-opted co -opted members of the board. So historically, we've previously co-opted members to the uh, mem member to the board from business representative um, organisations. And the proposal is that that is Barney, who is here today, um, with, from the Federation of Small Businesses, with the deputy or substitute member being um, Martin Hathaway of the Mid Yorkshire Chamber. There are two further co-op team members who we uh, have on the board at the moment. So we have Asma Iqbal and Nikki Chance Thompson. And though the term of those co-options um, expire this month, and therefore a proposal is asked, uh, the board is asked today to approve that those be extended for a further year. Should be said, of course, that if any co-opted member has applied to be a permanent member of the board and is successful, then that would supersede their co-option and they would be a current, they, they would become a, um, a member. So if the board is content to, um, agrees to appoint Asmar and Nikki as um, co-opted members, then jumping back to 220, 221 and 222, the proposal is that Asmar would continue as the left diversity champion. Um, and the proposal is that on, for, with the SME LEP representative and the TNI representative, we wouldn't propose to make um, appointments uh, to those positions today, but they would be done so after the other appointments have been made to the board. So that takes us through all of the process of um, the processes for the appointments. Um, the final uh, part of this paper was um, asking about the way in which the board comes together in the future. So, for instance, the proposal to hold perhaps fewer formal meetings, more informal ones, um, and we'd be really uh, grateful to hear any views from board members about the format and frequency going forward. Thank you very much, Alan. There is a lot in that. 
Um, and so thank you for taking it through. Um, my suggestion is we, we just sort of pause before the future board arrangements and we, we sort of approve everything or, or not approve everything as a, before that point and then we'll have that, that full conversation. The, there's just two points that I'd just like to add to your um, summary for, for us to consider as a board. Firstly, um, I'd just like to update quickly on the number of applications that we had for uh, board members um, since then because I think it's really telling um, of the, the quality and the type of applications that we've had. So we've had 33 um, applications uh, for board member positions, which I think is really quite impressive. Um, importantly, 20 of those um, are female. 16 um, are from uh, BAME um, backgrounds, uh, which I also think is good. And the interesting thing is when we went through the shortlisting, we shortlisted 13 of those 33, um, and those percentages are 77% female and 46% BAME. Um, so I think that's great. Now that that's you know covering aspects of diversity. I think really importantly as well as the sectors um, that some of these um, applicants have come from, including manufacturing, digital, hospitality, professional services, energy, transport, skills, culture, um, and, and I think we also have a very broad spread from the local authorities, um, which is sort of really helpful. So I just wanted to sort of stress that, and and those um, applications are sort of ready for the, the sort of panels to, to, to go. I wanted to stress <laughs> that as well. Um, I think secondly, I'd just like to pick up on, I think what's in uh, point two, point eighteen um, about the, um, the current recruitment timelines for the new NetLab chair. So currently it's saying, the advert's gone live, there's a deadline of the 30th of June for approval, and the expectation is the new post holder will be enrolled by the 22nd of July, which is great. I think as a board, we should embrace the possibility that those timelines don't hold as positively as they are set out in the paper. And if that's true, then there, there is likely to be a combined authority meeting where we're unsure of, of how the private sector would be represented. So, so my proposal for us to consider as a board is that we try to find a nominee from the private sector to attend any combined authority meeting on the unlikely case that those timelines are delayed, but we do know that there has perhaps been a track record of things like that occurring in the past. So can I, can I just ask you to sort of quickly respond on that, Alan, and then I'll, I'll open it out to everyone else. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. So, um, the, so, so uh, completely take the point, um, and it's important that the, the the board is represented at the at the combined authority on the twenty seventh of July. Um, so um, there are uh, there are there are there are two options. One is that, um, but I realise colleagues won't have had a warning about this. But there are there are two options. One is that the board could decide today who that person is. Um, uh, the alternative would be that the board decides today to delegate um, this formally to Ben. But uh, and clearly, he would decide it, and he he would consult with the board about who that person should be, and it would be a that it would be a, a, a formality of a process. Um, so, uh, so essentially, what would happen is after this meeting, um, people would consider who might be available to represent the let board on that day, and then we would um, formally agree who that would be. And if I've got anything wrong, Caroline will correct me. Caroline is smiling and nodding, which is helpful. Um, okay, so before I, what I'll do is I will run through those recommendations explicitly so that we know um, what we're deciding. But before I do that, I just want to open it up to um, any colleagues across the board who have a perspective or a comment to make on any of the things that, that Alan has said there. Bon. It, it, it seems on my first meeting to talk about things so sort of obviously naked self in way. But the SME champion has it, been a bugbear of the FSB, I suppose, but bugbear of mine for, for a number of years, in that it's a really easy thing to say, but doing it is, is huge. I mean, 97% of all businesses are SMEs. So I just wonder what sort of support do they get? It, what sort of job description is there? Or is it just a, you're the champion, good luck on your go? Because I, I think we really could improve how that's done, and I think it would benefit the left. Thank you, Barney. I think that's a really important question and welcome to the board. <laughs> Alan, would you like to respond on that? Uh, I think that's something to work through with the, the relevant, uh, the, the person we're nominated and completely take the point. And they would work, I mean, they would, uh, clearly mo most of the work that happens outside of the board meetings. So the key interface for them would be within the team, the teams within the combined authority who are working on um, matters of business support and so on. Um, and that would be their, that, so we, they would, we would, they would work 
they would work closely with those officers, and they would and th th those teams would provide support to those um, to that person. Um, I don't think we have a formal role profile for the role itself, um, and perhaps that's something that we should look at. I, don't, I realize it's not a particularly satisfactory no, answer. Well, well it is. I, I just wonder whether we can take an action that we, we will do that, not just for the SME champion, the but actually role. more formalize some of the other roles uh, that we're having across the board. Didn't speak to the others, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Polly. Um, sorry. If it's related, ask more please this go, and then I've got Councillor Pandel. Uh, I think I'm the vice president. Um, it is related. Um, I wonder if we could also look to see how, as diversity and inclusion champion, they, those roles could be integrated somehow, because we kind of should be working together as champions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when you have that discussion internally, could you just bear that in mind as well and keep me in the loop? And, and, and I suggest we would actually add that explicitly again to the action of defining the roles clearly um, and, and maybe bring all of those back to the board in September for the next meeting. Okay, are there any other comments or perspectives on, on that, or shall I lead us through the recommendations? Okay, so recommendation 10.1 um, notes that the local authority representatives and substitutes appointed to the LET board are set out in Appendix 1 of the report. So are we happy to approve that recommendation? Yes? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, 10.2, we've confirmed the current private sector representatives of the LET board are set out in Appendix 1 and agrees to extend the terms of office um, for Shirley, Cameron and Cully, each for a further three-year term to 28th of February 2026. Are we all happy with that? Yes. Um, 10.3, we note that the recruitment for new private sector board, LET board members are underway. And um, I, I shared the summary of the, the applications. We delegate authority to the mayor and the chief executive to make appointments as appropriate and on behalf of the board and to update the board accordingly. And I would note Alan's point in terms of process of that, which would involve um, the, the let board members in consultation rather than just being informed after, after the event. So are we all happy with 10.3? Yes. 10.4, we note the update on the vacancies for the LEP chair and deputy chair, and I think we would add um, to that point um, the consideration of putting a nomination um, for uh, the combined authority just in case we don't meet those timelines. My suggestion for the board is we take Alan's option two, and we don't try to resolve it um, today, but we uh, sort of are comfortable that we take that away as, a, as an action um, as Alan outlined. Are we all happy with that approach? Yes. Okay. Um, Item 10.5, um, we confirm the member of the LEP board to represent and engage with SME. As we've talked about SME, diversity and trade and investment. And then to summarize, we are continuing with ASMAR in 10.6 as the LEP diversity champion, but we are holding open 10.5 and 10.7, the SME champion and the trade and investment champion, with the added point of summarizing the exact details of, of, of the roles that we have. 10.8, um, we appoint uh, Barney. Um, of the FSB as the co-opted member to the LEP board to represent the business representatives group um, here. Um, and the, the point that I don't think was actually made in the paper is just because of diaries, it's always helpful to have a deputy. Um, the business rep groups have got together and have suggested that the deputy would be Martin Hathaway for the Mid-Yorkshire Chamber as the name substitute for a one-year period. So I just want to check that everyone is comfortable with 10.8. And I see nods. Thank you. Um, and then... Um, finally, we, uh, not finally, sorry, uh, we approve the extension of the terms of appointments for the co-opted members, Asma Iqbal and Nikki Chab Thompson by a further year. And, and as Alan said, that is subject to any um, procedures for the full um, let board uh, interviews. So I've got nods from everyone on that. Thank you. Um, so then, Alan, if I may, you, you asked your other question in terms of the feedback from the board on the format and frequency of the meetings um, going forwards. And from... Looking at the paper in 2.26, um, I'd just like to sort of say there is a recommendation here that it may be appropriate to hold fewer formal meetings, but perhaps more informal discussions in private to really dive down into the topics. Is, is there anything else you'd like to say about that, Alan, before I open it up for, to take the views of the board? Uh, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd add is that... Um, We've had a couple of sessions over the last few months where we've brought together not just the members of the LET board, but the wider private sector membership as well. And I think they've been really useful discussions, and that's worth considering as part of this conversation. 
the frequency of and, and what we use those sessions for, where we bring together the kind of wider family of people engaged across all of the committees. Thank you, Alan. That's a great point. And for history, we used to do that um, once a year at the annual general meeting. And, and this time last year, we decided, um, or I in influence that we'd like to do that more frequently and we've had that at, at least twice a year and, and potentially I think there is the opportunity to extend that to extend that further as well. So I'd just like to open this up for any any views on, on the meetings. Councillor Graham. Um, I'd just like to ask um, how many times do we meet for only a year and what are we proposing to reduce that to? So as I, as I understand it and please correct me if I'm wrong, currently or previously we have met four times uh, per year and the proposal is that we reduce that down to two formal meetings, one held in December, one in June, and that in between those dates, um, as we see fit, but probably at least one in between, we would have an informal meeting in private. Um, I, I'm just checking with officer colleagues that that is correct. Yes, it is. Okay. Alan, would you like to... The, the, the question from Councillor Hinchcliffe was... Uh, Ben, sorry, let me bring you in here. Um, it was so as to reflect the changing role of the LEP going forwards and to allow more time for LEP board members to have conversations about the issues in a freer format. Okay, so two. That is what we're proposing. How about two more? Two and two. Are there any other comments, or is there is there broad agreement with the proposal to have two meetings, um, formal meetings, and then at least two um, meetings in between those, so that we have four uh, meetings in total a year? Councillor Gray. Sorry, another question. Um, in terms of these meetings are obviously filmed and put out to the public, do we think that two is enough to have that transparency and let people know what we're up to as a board? Um, I'm not too sure two is enough for that, but I'm happy to yeah listen to what others think. Councillor Graham, I think, I think that's a great question, and I think the, the proposal is the agendas for those two formal meetings would have to contain a range of updates to ensure that those topics were, you know, rightly shared in, in public. Um, ben or Tracy? Is a, Tracy. Um, for me, I think you're absolutely right about scrutiny and transparency, really important, but we're not in a position that historically it used to be where there was a budget and that would, those um, approvals would be scrutinised. Who, the, who does it go to, and so on. For, for me, and very open to a discussion about this, but what I've, I've heard is that members saying, I just want to roll my sleeves up and get stuff done, rather than sit around a table and not really speak about, uh, or be, be asked for my opinion, or my experience and my suggestions. So it's a way to, to make sure the load is the same, so that people aren't overloaded and then don't want to be involved but also that we can get more done in the, t in the time that people can dedicate to it. But very happy for, to be persuaded otherwise. Councillor Hinchcliffe, could I... We should get out more then, shouldn't we? <laughs> so it's an opportunity to get out and around Absolutely. the region more. So it would be good to, if we could do as a, as a team, if we go out and see some enterprise projects that are taking place in parts of the region, and have a conversation about that, how it's working, how it's not working, how it could be improved to really sort of support our active learning. If that's if that's the opportunity being offered, that will be fine. I, I think that's an important point. There's lots going on right yeah. across the region that's and we don't need to limit it to the place where there are video conferencing facilities like this. Um, Alan, would you like to come back in? Thank you. I just wanted to respond to Councillor Graham's point as well, which I think is well made. Um, but, but I would say that the, um, all of the committees where the formal decisions are taken, so the combined authority itself and the six thematic committees and the three chairs of scrutiny are all publicly streamed live. Um, so there, there is a, uh, so th in that respect, all of, all of the decisions are taken in public, papers are published fully in advance, et cetera, et cetera. And Tom. Yeah, hi, I, I was just wondering about the, um, the agendas and the, the work program in a way, and if the objective is to deepen and strengthen the relationship with the private sector and we're not anymore in a position where we're having to, if you like, deliver national policy or, you know, align with national policy. It's quite an opportunity to rethink what would be the best relationship and some of it is about representation and making sure that, you know, we've got everybody 
informed and involved who's involved in that and um, you know that that would be I think a really good thing to do getting out and about and getting better engagement and understanding of of um, the sectors is important but there's, there are other agendas like the the support services that are provided the you know the payment terms of all the all the, the combined authority and ourselves and and um, in terms of supporting small businesses um, the, there's a sort of service provision bit and then there's the alignment of investment you know we'll talk about the West Yorkshire plan later and it what would be great is a position where the private sector have much more knowledge about what's coming through the pipeline and what the plans are from the public sector and so I would just encourage the team to maybe not be hemmed in by what we've done before necessarily but to think you know how could we really get the best um, relationship where people are able to really understand each other and also there's an ask of business as well from the mayor and the combined authority in terms of getting you know paying the real living wage and sign up to um, the charter and things like that so that there's a good I think opportunity to think a bit wider than maybe we've done previously for those maybe those two meetings that when we when we get together Thank you, thank you, Tom. I think that's a, a great point and, you know, a clear opportunity. And, and, and remembering this doesn't have to be a forever decision. We can, you know, sort of try this approach and, and sort of uh, you as a board can then, uh, you know, determine how, how to go going forward. Um, Councillor Pandor. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, just uh, thinking aloud in terms of what is it we're trying to achieve uh, based on uh, the, the LEP and uh, whatever guys that might be, the Mail Combined Authority. <clears throat> it's about uh, skills, investment, business, um, and how how going back to the transparency stuff. How how local people actually can engage with that. Uh, and, and the big question for the LEPs is uh, the the private sector, which is really really important. Um, and I think that's that's something really really positive that we've seen in in West Yorkshire, plus a bit of North Yorkshire. Um, so how how we carry on taking the messages forward, uh, and uh, make sure that the the different see. The, the reality is there's a lot of different models out there uh, nationally, and uh, I think we're sort of probably the best in the class in terms of working with the private sector. Um, so how can we, A, give whoever is going to be in government next year that, that full assurance that, you know, we, we are here to deliver. Uh, we are very open. We are very transparent. We give you more bang for your buck, uh, which, which we've got the, the arguments rehearsed. And, and I think... Um, we just need to get ahead of that game uh, because the, the male combined authorities are, are pretty new compared to all established organisations like local government. Um, and that, that debate is going to continue uh, at whatever level. So, so we need to make sure that, that that private sector delivery mechanism that we have, in terms of what Tracy says, you know, that we, we, want to, we want to deliver. That's what, that's what industry wants to do, deliver. And so do we as, 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 as mayors and uh, leaders. So with, with all, all that in the mix, if we can get a plan together regarding the, the two plus two meetings, and we have some very clear outcomes that we're trying to achieve, both as a joint body, so we're clear. Because the problem we have, I'd like to have more meetings, but, but as you know, we just haven't got enough time to date. Four meetings is going to be difficult as well. But if we're very clear what we're going to get out of it, and Susan's point is really, really valid. Um, we've got five authorities, so maybe an extra one, um, you know, uh, so that we, we all can actually go into our local authorities. Uh, and actually showcase the, the big schemes and big flag, flag, flagship schemes that actually aren't just about the local authority. It's about about the region. It, it's about UK PLC. It, it, you know, uh, and and so there's got to be there's got to be a lot more added value we get for the the meetings that we we, we, we have. Uh, so there's there's something to think about there. But, but I think I think the jury's out uh, in terms of how how this will evolve in, into the future. Thank you, um, Councillor Pandor, and uh, and I think you know we've 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 asked for um, oh sorry sorry Nikki <laughs> I, I was just going to say we've been, we've been asked for feedback and I think I think this has been a very helpful discussion. My my suggestion would be that that if there is a September meeting with a new chair, new board members, that this becomes a primary topic for exactly how um, the frequency and the format of these meetings should take place, and I would strongly encourage that to be on the agenda for them. Um, but but Nikki, may I pass to you? Yeah, mine was just sort of more of a general point around um, the ambition and vision and if we're going to engage the business communities um, 
what is it that we want them to do and how do they play a part of that and I know there's really exciting work that's coming out in the investment zone and trailblazers and some great things happening but I think for them to be part of that it's how are they going to contribute towards that ambition or how can we help them contribute towards the ambition so I like the idea of having more fluid meetings I think that works um, but yeah I think what's missing for me is the frequency and, and what we do is important but the why yeah. I wonder if that just needs a bit more definition and maybe it's just me I'm missing it I've had three weeks in Greece but, uh, <laughs> but I think for me it's the why we probably need to determine anyway that was it Thank you, Nikki, and welcome back from Greece. I think that's a really important point on the why. And I think I think what will help us is the West Yorkshire plan, because we're all working towards 2040, and to identify exactly to your point of why we're we meeting, what do we want out of it, where's growth, where's export, um, where's diverse recruitment, you know, all the stuff that's in the plan, the private sector are absolutely pivotal in helping us deliver that. So it's, it's deconstructing the plan um, and our five missions. And whilst I don't want an extra meeting, we have five regions, five missions. So maybe five is our lucky number. Um, but I think, I think there is an opportunity to maybe look at, um, you know, the first mission as a, an area of a priority, uh, prosperity for West Yorkshire. How do we make that happen? How do we set and train our expectations over the next few years and, and use these, the private sector to help us deliver that? But I think that's our blueprint. Great. And, and Fatima? Sorry, I, I couldn't miss an opportunity. I said I was going to sit here and listen, and I lasted exactly 48 minutes, which is pretty good for me. Um, I was just thinking in regards to re-envisioning the role and purpose of the board, we went to the Balmer City launch yesterday in Leeds, which was absolutely incredible. Um, and one of the things that really made me think was Marmot's principles of the role of the private sector in addressing inequality and I wondered whether there's an opportunity to lift and shift some of those elements and embed that in the work of the LEP too because it'd be a win-win for everyone wouldn't it? Thank, thank you Fatima, I think that's something that we should definitely take away and, and lead into the, the vision of this yes. September meeting to explore Mission 1 and, and how we can sort of reinvigorate the, the why behind it. So I, I think 10.10 asked for feedback. I, I, I really want to thank colleagues for a very full and, and, and you know, useful conversation about that and, and ask that we then sort of take that forwards um, into the plan and, and start, you know, making that happen, but working on the principle of those meetings, considering the feedback of potentially making it five to reflect the five um, local authorities and the, and the five missions as, as well. Yeah. Okay, so I will move us now on to um, item number seven. Um, which sort of follows on from this, but is now a nomination to the CA and an outside body. So thinking about membership of the CA committees and, and the external bodies such as Transport for the North and Northern Powerhouse 11. So Caroline, can I pass you to walk us through this one, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, as you say, this, this does follow on, and I think it's clear from the recommendations that it, it highlights the fact that we are in this transitional point with recruitment very live for, for, for membership. So there's a few delegations fed in here to proposals for the recommendations. I think the first thing it's doing on this is um, seeking approval from the board in terms of the appointments on the CA. And of course, we've discussed that um, as part of the last item. This is, this is seeking a proposal in terms of that um, sort of the, 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 the permanent arrangement. And it's that the LEP board chair, once appointed, becomes the LEP member on the CA and the LEP Board Deputy Chair, once appointed, becomes that substitute LEP member. So it's still seeking that as the recommendation, but it is subject to that recognition that if by the July meeting that appointment isn't in place, we now have a mechanism to ensure that LEP Board representation is on there through, through that nomination. So we, can, we will reference that um, in the minutes for this, if that's agreed by the Board. Uh, it then, because this is part of it, the formal business, because this is a formal item for the board, um, is seeking the confirmation of the board of the current um, nominations for private sector let board members and roles of deputy chairs on the combined authorities committees. And they're set out at Appendix 1. Appendix 1 sets out all the current private sector reps and let board members. Let board members are highlighted in bold to show that. It is fair to say that we have... Um, with having the vacancies on the LEP board, we have vacancies, of course, in terms of LEP board membership and deputy chair um, roles on the CA committees. 
And so that comes to recommendation 10.3 here, where we're wanting to actually take that forward once the recruitment's complete, which is why we're seeking um, delegated authority from the board for the mayor and the LEP chair to make those nominations um, for LEP board members onto the combined authority committees. Now, obviously, that would be done in consult. You know, there is a, this is a formal recommendation, but there's a process that would sit around that, and that would be the consultation. But it would mean that we wouldn't have to wait for a formal LEP board meeting to enable that to go forward. And so it, it expedites the ability for us to have that LEP board membership back on our um, decision-making committees. 10.4, um, as has been the practice, we always seek the nominations from the LEP board in terms of that wider private sector representation on our committees. So this is private sector reps who aren't LEP board members. But the recruitment historically has come through the LEP board, so we seek that confirmation that those, that those um, private sector reps are recommended to the CA to continue and sit on those committees for this following year. And as part of that, and again highlighted in Appendix 1, there are a number of those roles where we, we usually have those nominations on a three years with the potential for a further three year period. And that first three years has come to an end and we are seeking um, authority here to say to the, to the combined authority, we would like that term to extend. So that's 10.4. Fine, almost there. Um, 10.5, in terms of let board member representation on TFN, um, Again, we are seeking, um, that we have obviously a delay in that in terms of our um, current recruitment, so we're seeking a delegation again in that to enable those proposals to be made to TFN um, outside the LEP board formal meetings. And then finally, at 10.6, to note that, um, that following the appointment of the chair, there are appointments to outside bodies that would follow as, as a result of that exit the CEO position. So, so, Chair, they are the six recommendations. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Carolyn. And I think that um, follows very closely on from the previous paper. And your summary of those six means that I, my proposal is that unless there are any questions or points on that, we take all of those six and I ask for approval to, to sort of carry all of those six um, forward. So just asking if there are any questions or comments. No. So everybody's happy to move those six. Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Caroline. That's very helpful. Um, if we now move to item number eight, um, we, we move on to the, the non-formal sort of parts of the meeting and, and obviously very important on the economic update. I, I think it's fair to say, Tom, we've had three very, very deep dives on the economy in previous LEP board meetings um, and they've been really, really useful to outline the macroeconomic context um, and then the West Yorkshire specific views, but then importantly, you know, what are we going to, to, to do about it? And I think the paper, you know, in, in that format uh, is, is very clear. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight the West Yorkshire Business Survey launch, uh, which is coming soon. And I think that will be very useful information for, uh, you know, the combined authority to sort of take on. And also the actions that we're taking on energy, UK SPF and, and the economic strategy. So I just wondered if you might, Tom, just sort of like, summarize that and, and then we can just open for any discussion points from from members before we then move on to the economic strategy that you know what next are we going to do yes th th thank you chair so to sort of summarize the macroeconomic section it can be summarized in one word basically which is inflation um inflation has started to to drop albeit it hasn't dropped as much as the markets predicted um for people that sort of follow what the FT or the Economist or the other kind of financial reporters are saying, there is now an expectation actually that inflation is going to be around longer than they were anticipated. There was wage growth data coming out this morning, um, which was pretty strong, um, which has kind of, we're in this now awkward situation where the Bank of England said interest rates by the end of the year, 4.75%, 4 then we'll take stock. You've now got the markets predicting 5% or above. Um, so, so there is now this kind of dichotomy, if you like, between, between the markets and the policymakers. One of the things to mention in particular is around, is around food. And without putting too much of a dampener on the, on the warm weather, things like climate change leading to hotter summers will actually have an impact on how sticky food inflation is. So this is just another consideration as well as labour shortages, as well as um, sort of the supply chain shocks overhanging from COVID climate change impacts are going to start having having an impact on some of these things as well, particularly particularly food. 
In terms of um, where we go next, if you like, the Bank of England um, analysis seems to suggest that employment is generally going to stay, stay steady. We have started to see a softening labour market in West Yorkshire, which I'll mention, but generally speaking, they're not expecting a big shock. However, on the other side, business investment, despite the government, um, the tax cuts on, in, on business investment at the spring budget, they're forecasting investment to basically not, not, not increase and in some instances actually go down, which for West Yorkshire, an economy that lags when it comes to productivity, this is a, a big issue for us. Now, moving away from the macro perspective to, to the more, more local perspective, what we have seen is that there are still net new businesses month on month. So you quite often see this when, when economies become a bit, bit shaky. You see lots of companies leaving, uh, leaving uh, their business behind, lots of people entering, entering the business landscape, whether it be you know, necessity driven or opportunity driven. But something to, to flag, which is particularly important, is the sectoral makeup of this shift. We're seeing the most volatility in wholesale and retail trade and accommodation and food, which given the price of everything going up, given that households are being squeezed, it's not too much of a surprise that these are the sectors that we're seeing this volati volatility in. Um, but the good news, if you like, is that whilst um, liquidations have increased in these sectors, so have new entrants. So businesses that, are, that have unfortunately not been able to get through this period are being replaced by other businesses, which will hopefully be able to, to get through this period. In terms of the um, business survey, which, uh, which the lecture I mentioned, so this is our annual business survey um, of around 1,000 companies across, across West Yorkshire. It covers topics such as um, future growth projections, future employment projections, investment predictions, uh, projections, sorry, um, ex export, um, export intentions, are, are businesses looking international? And we've added in a few questions this year uh, um, to more focus on barriers to innovation and things like that. Um, the reason why we've been able to add in questions basically is because going back a year, going back two years, we obviously had a lot of COVID questions. And Touchwood, despite all of the challenges we face, COVID isn't one currently, um, and it will hopefully it will hopefully remain like that. So I'm happy to have a more in depth conversation about about the the themes if if people would like that. And then just to kind of finish on the labour market within West Yorkshire before quickly going through the actions, the labour market is still generally pretty strong. We have started to see an uptick in out of work claimants as well as um, a, a slight downward trajectory in the number of payroll employees, but vacancies are still above pre-pandemic levels, which on one side is good because people can, it, the vacancies tend to be in high skill industries. On the flip side, it's a supply side problem, um, but the labor market, unlike kind of previous recessions, the labor market seems generally generally pretty, pretty decent. It's just softening a little bit compared to what it was. And just to, to finish, in terms of actions, so we have the energy price urgency grant scheme, which provided practical support to reduce energy bills. As of the 17th of March, over 450,000 of support has been granted to just shy of 150 businesses with a further, a further 150 grand of spending to be carried out if the new submissions are all, are all approved. There's a shared prosperity fund, which is 83 million, split across community in place, supporting local businesses and people in skills, with an additional two and a half million for, rural in, for the Rural England Prosperity Fund. And then finally, um, as the chair mentioned, we've got the economic strategy and more of that will be covered in item nine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Tom, um, for, for the summary. And, and I just wonder if, if anyone else would like to um, contribute anything from sort of intel that, that's going on in the, in the local market. I, I look possibly at Barney um, for, from a you know, perspective from, you know, not just the FSB, but from anything that's come up in, in business rep groups. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Barney, but is there anything that you'd like to, to add to that? No, I mean, well, I say no, and then I, then I, then I say, then I, then I carry on. So yes, is what I mean. Uh, I think a lot of that was when we talked about this at the meeting before, and we all went, yeah, this sounds like, like it is. I think the big thing to say is at the beginning of this year, we, we were told the sky was going to fall on our heads and it didn't. And, 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 and that has been really quite helpful. But, but it's sort of, I mean, you were talking about inflation, one word inflation, I'd say the one word is, you know, things are just coming on, but growth is very slow, the economy is very sluggish, and part of that thing is confidence. On the energy, the big thing with energy, and big thing to think about with energy is, just because energy bills, they're now sort of about double what they were. Don't think that everyone's affected the same, because it depends how, how, when you fixed your 
contract and, and businesses have to fix their contracts. So we're, we've got a big campaign nationally, we're having some success with some of the companies, of allowing people to, who had to fix their contract at the back in the last year when prices were highest, to be able to come back and revisit them. And we're, we're having some joy with that. And that's a big thing we, I think we should all be looking at. That, that's going to make some of the biggest difference to some of this. And, and, and other than that, I mean, you're talking about... Uh, in terms of employment, I think we'd echo that, but it's, it's still very sectoral differences in that as well, which is, which is something to, to, to be aware of, I suppose. Thank you, um, Barney, that's very, very helpful. And, and May, you'd like to just come in? Um, just on that point, Barney, about energy, we found that the take-up of the energy emergency grants is slow. What, what, what can we do? Why do you think that is? Um, is it because it's match-funded? What's the? What do you think... The issue is for business. I'm not sure. I mean, I, th I think it is, it's one of those difficulties where business is finding out, I mean, how do businesses find out something is available? I have to say, I did look for that on the website fairly recently and couldn't find it, so that wouldn't help either, because a lot, a lot of the support you have to actually email somebody to get, and I just wanted to get some details to pass on to somebody and I couldn't find it, so that probably doesn't help. But I, I think it's just keep going out there. And, and I mean, what, what I think you have that is quite a strength for, for West Yorkshire. You do have the growth manager who, who probably talked to as many people as anybody in, in, in the region to get them to keep getting out and, and think about, you know, what, where, where do large numbers of businesses congregate? And it, it is around things like service offices, it is around some of the networking stuff. And, and the growth managers know all this, and I think they're, they're the people to arm with this information, and hopefully they'll start spinning up. But it could be more visible on the website, would be one thing, I think. Thank you, Bonnie. And I know the team are trying to make, you know, the business support that is available more visible, more, more simple and, and amplify it through there so that we're getting new businesses that, that aren't part of the LEP network in, in that as well. I think specifically on the um, on the energy point, you know, whilst we have allocated, um, I'm looking at paragraph 2.1.3, we've allocated a million. Um, and we, we might just want to consider, Councillor Pandora, in the next beat committee, whether we continue to push up to that limit or whether we ask the question, is there anything else that we could offer with the four 400,000 remaining that might actually sort of support, you know, more businesses um, recognising that this is a sort of a state of flux as, as well. Um, please can I bring in Phil, who I think you wanted to come on on that point, and then uh, Councillor Hinchley. And finally, thank you for that feedback. Um, I think we hear that point and we, we observe that point around the availability, the availability of people knowing about this, this support. Um, thanks for the kind words about the growth managers, which is obviously one route. I think just to flag, um, the team are working on launching a web page, which will, which you also suggest a solution, as well. Um, and so, we, so we, we're working that. But I, I think we need to probably um, continue our conversations with organisations, particularly like yours, on the FSB and the FSB channels. I know we do that, but I think we need to do that a bit more. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Phil, and Councillor Hinchworth. Yeah, um, obviously you mentioned a little bit in the labour market on the report, but not an awful lot of em employment and skills. And I think that is an area where well, the combined authority is traditionally quite strong and thinking about what can we do on that point. Because I know uh, if you look at um, the stats that were I looked in different arenas, um, you'll see that you know worklessness uh, is going up, in fact. So there's more people not employed, not claiming benefits, but not employed, and that is an issue. Um, and uh, the skills levels still need improvement. And if we've got a shortage of people in, in the labour market, that's because we've got people, but we're just not training them up uh, quick enough or well enough in the areas they need to be skilled up to get a job. So there's, a, there's an obvious disconnect there, isn't there? The public sector is always trying to bridge. But I think, you know, is there more we can do on the skills agenda? I would ask, really, for, as a combined authority to make sure that more of that, those people who are perhaps workless at the moment can get those opportunities that we need them to fill. Yeah, that's a very um, fair and balanced comment, uh, Councillor Hitchcock. Um, Tom, I, I know you want to come in there, and then, and then I'll bring Tom in to respond to, to some of those. Yeah, just uh, I was going to make a um, similar point to Councillor Hinchcliffe's, and just that I think the team you know, are very aware of that here who we're working with, and I do think it's one of those areas where we're in this sort of period of uncertainty and flux and have been for a while, and our, it looks like we're going to be for a bit longer. So... In those circumstances, investment tends to gravitate to those places where they sort of know what they're going to get and they can reduce the risk. And one way they can do that is by us giving them confidence that they're going to have the labour market and they're going to have the access to people, you know, coming through. And that is, I think that's an area that we can actively work during this period to to help our prospects collectively. And, and it, 
links to the point about I was making about development and you know again once people know that there's a pipeline that's that's clear and you know then they know there's going to be you know things happening in this part of the world over a prolonged period of time they tend to base more people here they once people are based here they recruit better because you know you just you're not just going for one project you know that there are a number of projects in the system and that was what was great about UK reef for us because we were able to showcase that quite literally so I think maybe I just think both of those are areas where I think the business support work has, has been said is a real strength of the CA and something that we should continue but it's that it's that skills and development side where you know we need to just get that visibility up maybe about what we're doing and how we're doing it collectively and this part of the world being somewhere that's a safe haven for investment. Thank you, Tom. And, and I think that skills point that we're, we're picking up, I think we, we will pick that up, I think, with our private sector sort of vice chair on skills, Shirley, but and maybe the skills committee could be a, um, a, a good point for that conversation to carry on. Um, Tom, would you like to come back in on that conversation before we just wrap this item up? Yeah, just, just very quickly on, on, on the skills. So on the economic inactivity point, um, at uh, previous, previous meetings we have um, delved into that a bit more. The, the part of the challenge with that is the data is just not as frequent as other data so as we get new data that tends to be when when we add it in but just two things to flag what one is the business survey that was already mentioned earlier on where we do ask things like what what skills barriers exist do you offer things like apprenticeships graduate schemes those types of things um so over the summer we'll be collecting that so that will be a good a good indicator and also um we're about to start writing the annual state of the region report which for people that have seen this before it's a very very long document but it basically covers every sort of issue that you know committees will will cover and it's all it will all be in one place with dashboards and it will cover things like skills issues so looking at qualification levels looking at things like vacancies where these labor shortages are things like that so so there is more to come on, on this thank you tom and and just if i just pass to trace first and then and then to phil just to say that looking at the um, inactive, um, there's a lot of conversations going on nationally about who are these people, and there does seem to be an increase in those who are ill waiting for uh, appointments for uh, operations. So they might want to go back to work, but currently they just can't work. So it's very hard to get that data, isn't it? But we're definitely it's trying to work out who they are. But also just around the skills, we're trying lots of ways to enable people to get the skills that they need. So just a couple of examples I think might be worth sharing. One is bus driver uh, recruitment. We've been able to use that money, um, for skills money, to go into communities like one in Bradford, Homewood I think it is, the community centre, open up that community centre for the first time in years, uh, recruit drivers and then there's now stay and play and cooking classes there. Also using the apprenticeship levy share scheme, ASDA, for example, have, uh, they funded 10 early years teachers to go on to the next level, really helps us with our family support. But uh, recently 11 PCSOs funded by ASDA apprenticeship share scheme. We're trying really creative ways to use it. But fundamentally, five skills funding streams and different programs often with different deadlines different criteria different departments it is too chaotic so we are really that's why we're pressing so hard for that trailblazer to get the skills you know give us the give us the power and the money to deliver absolutely to what you're talking about for the businesses in bradford and across west yorkshire because businesses are telling us what they need and we are stymied because of this a myriad of schemes and so on. So I just wanted to share with you my misery around this, and that I know I know it is a priority for business. Thank you, and Councillor Hinchcliffe, if you want to come back on. Can I just that. Are we still doing the sort of briefings with colleges across the region about um, labour market surveys and skills requirements? We're still doing that, are we, on a regular basis? Because I think that is really useful thing that the combined authority does in terms of. That, that intelligence across the region, saying what's out there to inform the curriculum thing. And I think from a skills point of view, it's level one and two that 
we need funding more than anything really. I know everybody wants to fill fund level three because <laughs> all employers want level three. Well, yeah, but they've got to get level one and two before they can get to level three. So, so some of that can fund as much of that as possible can fund that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Susan. And not just economic insights, but also the transport insights as well that are sort of going on is there. Um, Phil, can I just come to you to sort of wrap that up and, and then I'll move us from the update into the economic strategy. Uh, this is potentially quite a large conversation on skills, so I won't go into delve into much detail, but absolutely kind of the level one and two skills point and employment support is really, really important. Um, we do have, um, and we have, and it's been alluded to by others, a series of different programmes, one of which is Employment West Yorkshire, which is based in local authorities, that community will support around that, which is part of the answer. But also, just to, just to flag, um, looking at the needs of businesses and how we support the changing demands of businesses is something we've been working hard on in the last year or two. And we've been developing a series of um, series of interventions, either linked to the boot camps, which are looking at um, upskilling people that are looking at job changes um, and into different sectors and supporting them into that. But also there is a um, package of things that, that are around the digital green and business sector that are coming to the next CA for approval, which is um, responding to work that we've been doing in the Employment and Skills Committee, what we've been doing with local authorities and what we've been doing in business, with the business community. Um, also linked to the um, local skills improvement plan that I know many of you are involved with. Thank you very much, Phil, and, and thank you for that um, summary of the discussion. I think an important one to follow up on, on skills, um, absolutely. Um, okay, so, so moving on to the um, economic strategy uh, from the update, which is item nine um, on the agenda. I know we have been discussing as a board progress on economic strategy for, for a while. I think it's been very integrated into the work of the West Yorkshire Plan, which, um, as we know from the um, sort of a later agenda item, is, is here um, and will be launched on um, Friday. I think the team have been very busy, you know, building the evidence base, especially on sectors. So we're, we're being asked as a board to um, note the, uh, the presentation, which is in Appendix 1, um, and also comment on the approach. So um, I was expecting Sarah to be here, Phil. Am I going to pass to you to, to, to do this in, in the interim? C can we just take this as read, but maybe just call out some highlights so that we could sort of start the, the conversation? So, yeah, so Joe is here to talk about the kind of highlights and the that was just great, which is great. Um, I wasn't going to say much more, and I think actually some of the conversation we've had about the role of the private yeah. sector in influencing our strategy and feeding our ambition. I just want to say um, a couple of things, one of which is whilst um, the paper itself alludes to this being anchored to the mission one, if you like, I think um, it, it's a bit naive to think that it will, it will just be mission one. It, the, the economic agenda is much wider than that, and we'll touch on everything from, from health to the environment to skills. And, and the other thing to say is, in terms of our own um, kind of um, architecture of strategies, this will clearly be overarching both our approach to business support and employment and skills and other barriers for the business and the economy face that require kind of public sector intervention and partnership working. And at that point, I just want to hand over to Joe, who's going to say a few high-level things about the attached, detailed um, document. Uh, thanks, Phil. Yeah, I was just going to say a little bit about the process of evidence gathering and then the plans for consultation, um, some of which is set out in the, the slide pack that was circulated as part of the papers. So we are refreshing um, the West Yorkshire Economic Assessment that was undertaken in 2019 as part of the development of a local industrial strategy, which was government policy at the time. So some of that information is updated annually as part of the state of the region, but where it hasn't, if there is new data available since 2019, we are refreshing that. Um, there's going to be new um, regional uh, forecasts provided. We're in the process of procuring a new regional economic model. Uh, we are working with Data City to do some mapping of um, the new economy in West Yorkshire, building on a, a national piece of work they did with the Centre for Cities think tank. We're working closely with the West Yorkshire universities on a, a call for evidence that they've got some funding specifically to work with policymakers to support the policy making process. So we're looking at a few areas where we think the academic evidence base can really support this uh, work. So we're hoping to get some further deep dives from them on uh, childcare issues, what that means for the West Yorkshire economy, the impact on business, the impact on people wanting to go into the labour market and also the, the sector itself. They're going to help us look at the informal economy and what that means in West Yorkshire and the implications for the formal economy in terms of that, that relationship. 
Uh, and they're also going to look at the future of work uh, with a specific focus on AI, what that means for the region, the challenges, but also the opportunities, and sort of linking that back to the childcare issue um, in terms of what it means for those sectors that are much more face-to-face, -face, involve caring, um, what kind of AI transformation could do. Um, we are commissioning some work on inward investment to refresh your in inward investment strategy. So we haven't had an inward investment strategy since 2014. So post Brexit, um, post pandemic, what does that look like? Um, but that is something that we are, we are going to commission external experts to, to do for us. There's uh, a lot of work ongoing to integrate health into this. It's something that the local authorities are working very closely with us on it and engaging with our colleagues um, from the ICB and the public health consultant that we now have um, at the combined authority. And a big part of this is actually looking at our existing policies and strategies around skills, innovation, digital, uh, business productivity, making sure they sort of align well and, and, and updating where, where they need to be. So in terms of consultation then just briefly, um, we're working closely with all of the local authorities uh, collaboratively, but also um, individual events uh, in each of the districts. Um, Colleagues um, in our directorate are working on an EDI strategy for business support, but we really want to join that up with this work because um, obviously the two things uh, really closely align. So we had a, an away day recently that ASMA uh, attended and had some really great conversations there. So the next step that we want to do for that is to, to join up that work and do some stakeholder mapping. So, you know, we know the stakeholders that we usually speak to, that we engage with, but um, thinking about some of those groups that we haven't traditionally spoken to, engaged with, um, and you know, what do we need to do to, to involve them in this? Um, how can we understand the challenges and, and how they can, can support this work? So um, there's going to be a, a process of, of that stakeholder mapping taking place. Um, so there's various sort of workshops and things being planned over the summer. Um, and hopefully if um, kind of the evidence collection is co completed and we get these stakeholder events in place, we can start to do some drafting in the autumn. Um, so I think it would be really welcome to get input from members of the board, um, whether that's attendance at workshops or setting up um, specific events and things to support the, the development of this. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Joe. And just, just before I open it up to colleagues, I, I guess I'd just like to reflect one of the earlier conversations about the wider private sector uh, community and, and just making sure that all of the private sector members who are um, part of all of the decision making committees are sort of added to that stakeholder engagement session are actively in, engaged with, as I, as I know they will be, but, you know, making sure that we keep um, you know, going around that private sector member base so they, so they know what's going on and they feel that they can contribute to those really important conversations on economic strategy. Um, so based on the update from Phil and Joe, are there any uh, comments? Um, we're, we're being asked to sort of note this approach and to sort of comment on um, how we could um, make it better. Um, Councillor Hinchley. I know uh, Shirley's not here today, but I'm sure she, if she was, she'd talk about the fact that Bradford University has got the large number of AI undergraduates in anywhere in the country and, and that, that shows a piece in the Yorkshire Post this weekend that was talking about the future of AI and what what skills undergraduates need and what the future holds so that just speaking to some of those undergraduates at Bradford University would be really interesting actually as part of the development of the of the economic strategy I would suggest um, I, I've also I heard you mention about um, EDI strategy for business one mind hearing from asthma what what that was what that was about and that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect segue, yes. I was gonna. I was just going to give you my views on attending. Thank you for the invitation um, to attend the uh, away day. I have to say, I was blown away by the number of initiatives held internally within uh, your organisation. I've certainly been talking about them ever since I've come away from the away day. And the mantra for me was more about when we look at stakeholders and business, it's we're doing it ourselves and we therefore um, are relaying this in the policies that we're writing and the initiatives that we're taking forward. So for me, it was brilliant to be there and just witness what's going on internally because that is what you're expressing, your values are, and that's the business. As a business, they're aligned with my values. So when you come to me with collaboration for stakeholders, etc., I think you should be speaking about that because you automatically get that buy-in um, so maybe the comms could be a little bit better around that because I didn't know until I attended how many initiatives are running internally and how inclusive the organisation kind of is on different levels. So 
well done in the way that it was run as well. I just think the informal way in which Phil went about the whole day actually added value. Um, and that could be something that we could take away from future meetings as well, because they worked well. Well, that's great feedback and, and also the points on communicating <laughs> that as well. Um, Phil, you'd like to come on. I just wanted to say um, <clears throat> a couple of things, one of which was, um, you know, the, particularly the South Asian women that work in our team were really, really valued you being there and really valued talking to you about the day and, and, and uh, valued kind of your insight. And I think another thing is we're talking about let board and private sector members being involved in our work. I think there's a... There's a case study there about getting to meet from the wider teams rather than just the senior people that sit around this table um, and see our delivery in action. So I think we took away that, that and we want to do more of that kind of thing as a department. And I'll certainly, we'll certainly be thinking about that. Th thank you, Phil. Um, Barney, I think, let's come along. Well, you'll be pleased to know these are, these are notes that Becky made for me. So <laughs> she, there's three things she raised that, that I think are worth just, just bringing up. Uh, the first was about when you looked at your definition of clusters on... It says page 74 in the notes. And she was saying that the, that the clusters are more, they look like they're just around similar type, similar type businesses. They're not looking at the SIP codes rather than actually looking at true clusters around things like supply chains or R&D infrastructure and things like that. So I think that, that's something that, that she in particular could help with, I think, some of the thinking around that because they've got, got uh, the national thinking around that. Another thing she looked at and she wanted me to raise was the trade investment. And when looking at uh, exports, it, it doesn't, it'd, it'd be quite useful, I think, to look at, I say I think, she thinks, to look at uh, EU and non-EU and, and how that's changed and also look at the size of businesses because obviously we hear that it's the smaller businesses who have stopped exporting. Mm -hmm. So is that the case in, in West Yorkshire? If so, what, what's, that, what's it going to mean for, for our strategy? And, and the final thing, which I think has probably sort of came up already with around skills, but it's, it's around uh, underemployment and in particular graduates doing non-graduate jobs and, and, and is there an issue there? And, and is there any way of measuring that or, or working out what sort of an issue it is, what sort of problem it is, and what, what, what we do about it? So there are the three things. We'll look at those just to say on the clustering. So that's um, part of that is why we've got the Data City uh, dashboard, because they use um, a different way of categorising businesses, so moving away from the SIT code. So we'll be able to draw some of that out through the, the Data City analysis that we do. Thank you, Barney, Becky, uh, and Joe. Um, I, I also just like to raise the, the point on university. So that the mayor and I were actually at the um, a dinner with all of the vice chancellors, um, all their substitutes, last night, um, and we talked about not just the West Yorkshire plan, but the economic strategy. Um, Bradford did indeed talk about their strengths in AI, um, and I think, all I think I raised it, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all were very, very keen to contribute uh, to that, as and to sort of recognise the huge role that our you know higher education sector plays for the economy generally and to sort of quantify that a, a, a little bit more. Um, Phil, I think you wanted to, to come in. Just to kind of wrap up a few points and, and I think it's an excellent suggestion for Councillor Hinchcliffe. We often talk about the AI students at, um, in the department at Bradford and their leadership there um, and I think kind of getting voices of people who are going to be the skills, the, 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 the labour market for an, an industry that's really, really growing and a sector that's really growing is really, really important. Um, and then, um, Barney, on some of your points around export, um, we are developing in tandem, and um, the business committee is looking at this as well, the, um, an inward investment strategy, and we have a trade strategy as well. And I think it's important we look at all of this in the round and look at the barriers, particularly through the different types of companies to export, because that's, that's one of our major drivers of growth, and there are some challenges there. So I think we need to hear that point in terms of our next steps. Nikki. I just read a sort of really sad thing here under skills, which was around um, we have a significant number of people who are excluded from the labour market. So there's kind of getting the industry to think about how they bring people on board, but we need a bit like the work I've been doing with WeCan through Leeds Beckett. Quite often, and this is helping women into leadership, people feel that they can't do something, they don't have that ambition or or wherewithal to think about getting the skills or getting the things that they need to get into better paid work or work at all. Um, so how, how do we approach those people themselves? How do we actually approach the people we want to get into the workforce and encourage them to do some of these things? And is that is that part of this strategy or is this something that perhaps is going to sit at a more local level? I'm probably answering the question and people in here know the answer, but it just struck me that's a really sad thing to read. So how do we now help people have that ambition, have that motivation, aspiration, 
to have access to some of these things. Sorry, that's just no, no, a, a, a great reflection. Um, Fasma, I saw your hand up. I don't know if it was a link point. I, I'll, let me bring you in now, and then I'll it, pass back to Phil. So, so Nikki kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Great, my, no, it's good. It's good. Um, because I literally was going to ask a question about the SWOT analysis and the childcare question uh, particularly. I think there's an opportunity with the Fair Work Charter, isn't there, and how we utilise that strategically to address some of the inequality. But I also wonder whether the network we're starting to form in the name of the Mayor, the West, uh, well, I can't remember the acronym, we call it WOWI, which is Women of West Yorkshire, Women of the World West Yorkshire, we're setting up, which will address a sort of strategic forum where women come in together to explore some of the issues, but also strategically to combine um, expertise, insights, and share good practice to address some of these barriers too. So I think there's a role here for the left, actually, about how we support women, but not just women, because men equally um, experience the same, but also other areas of inequality when it comes to access to work. It goes back to your point, Mayor, as well, about people that are waiting due to ill health to come into the workplace. And I think there's some work to do with the Fair Work Charter about how we utilise that as a lever for a conversation with the wider West Yorkshire sector about how we can support people to work in a really inclusive way. Great, F thank you. And a, a good tag team effort there, Fazwa and Nikki. That's, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll build that in, but Phil, do you want to just wrap up? Yeah, uh, excellent points and not, and not stupid points, not stupid questions either, Nikki, so you shouldn't be concerned about that. So um, I think the barriers to work, it's a really important part of the economic strategy when I talked about that, I talked about skills and employment. Um, I think all those points are heard and I think kind of that input would be really valued that you talk about. Um, childcare is clearly something that is a huge barrier to many people, many women in particular, but many people broadly in terms of access to the labour market and access to reaching their full potential. Um, and we'll link into the Fair Work Charter where we are now developing our thoughts on the delivery of that. Um, I think another point I'd make on top of all of that is just don't forget the people who are actually in work and some of the challenges they have with health as well whether that's their kind of mental health, presenteeism, um, you know, musculoskeletal, all sorts of issues. And um, I think that is something that I know the, the NHS and various places have been working on. And I think it's something that, that we need to be mindful as well. So it's not just the people that can't have access to, to work, but also the people that are in, in, in work but can't reach their full potential. And that could be because they can't get the childcare for the, the full hours they need. Or, or it could be because of their, the, the challenges they have with their own mental health or other issues. But it does, the evidence does suggest that the two major issues are stress, anxiety, the three major issues are stress, anxiety, and muscular lethal issues are the three big things that we need to work on. Okay, thank you, Phil and everyone. We were asked to um, note the update and provide uh, some input, and I think that conversation's been very, very helpful. My suggestion is we keep that conversation live for the September meeting as well um, and, and sort of add that to. Uh, to, to, to the agenda. Um, if we move on to item 10, um, which is on investment zones, and I think this serves to provide an update on, on quite an interesting policy area. It's uh, something that was uh, announced um, back in September, and there's been a lot of governmental changes since then, but um, you know, it's, it's something that's available only for MCAs. Um, it, it's about an £80 million uh, offer o over five years. But I think importantly, it's also a signal um, that it can bring of, of strength for, um, for, for the region. So um, we're being asked to note this paper and provide feedback on some of the revenue-focused um, incentives. Phil, can I um, ask you to introduce some of the detail, please? Yeah, and it's a really timely um, moment to have this conversation because we are in the middle of discussing this both across the region and we've been working with local authorities um, the university and higher education sector and also we're planning to have a series of business um, engagement this week and over the next few weeks on this um, um, to make sure um, we're, we're putting uh, kind of our, our best foot forward in terms of our case to government and also we're delivering the best package of things we can possibly do to meet these outcomes. I think just kind of starting with the why this has been um, we are one of a number of regions across the country that have got that have got this this isn't a classic we're competing with the other areas. We, we have this, we just need to work out and organize how we do this in our, in our region. And they're designed kind of broadly to deliver three broad outcomes, one of which is increased rates of innovation, um, and, and the other is to um, level up the UK regions, but also the third one, and this links to Tom's presentation about a key challenge in terms of our productivity nationally, but the level of business investment in the country, and that's something that I know that nationally is a big, a, a huge issue. Um, relate to our productivity is increasing the level of private sector investment and giving that confidence there to do that. Um, what we've done already is we've been working to 
develop um, with a range of partners what our proposition is as a region. So we were, it, it was set out there were five sectors um, or clusters of sectors where we were asked to give a, a view about which sectors we championed and those sectors were um, life sciences, creative industries, green industries, advanced manufacturing, and digital um, and um, we decided after after discussion that um, we couldn't put forward just one of those sectors and we decided to put forward two of those sectors which were um, digital and health um, so health 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 um, innovation but that was linked to life sciences and there's a crossover there in terms of digital health and that and and um, that that we put that proposal into government and we are still waiting on formal feedback from government, but informal feedback from government on our proposal in terms of clusters of sectors has been really, really positive. Um, and, and there has been a view that we are kind of a bit further than some of the other areas, which is great to hear. Um, and um, the next step is for us to think about the, the kind of mix of what our kind of place interventions might be, whether that's kind of a, a capital investments or taking advantage of either um, business rates, retention, relief, uh, and, and tax incentives linked to sites, and um, revenue interventions around business support skills related to these, these priority se sectors. Um, and we're working with local authorities, universities, and businesses on those things. Um, we, we, as I said at the start of this, we, we've got some sessions in the, the coming weeks to look, to look at this, where we have invited um, businesses who are in the relevant sectors to come and, and feed in their views. And we're working really, really closely with... Um, all the local authorities and all your colleagues on this um, to help work and develop that. So it's just a really, even though it's a for information paper, it's a really timely opportunity for us as a board to reflect on this and give some steers which we can pass through to the team as we develop these conversations. Thank you, Phil. Um, I agree it's a total timely update and I think the, um, the unique nature of digital health for, for our region with five out of the six NHS headquarters sort of based here um, is, is a really compelling proposition. So can, can I just ask for, for the private sector members, you know, across all of the, the committees, what is the best way to engage, you know, beyond, you know, instant feedback today? How can we, you know, continue to make sure that we're shaping as this conversation, you know, progresses to autumn, I believe, where we, we'll have a final proposal to government? So I suggest I suggest kind of a, there's a few broad ways. So um, there's the the most obvious way would probably be to um, if you if you're aware of um, and we can we can share the list of businesses we've invited to the digital and the health tech workshops. If if you're aware of additional businesses that you think should be involved in that um, from your networks, then please then please kind of hand that to the team and I'll get the team to circulate that to 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 board members. Um, the second way is to find feed in comments and discuss with us directly, but I'd rather have, given the partnership nature of this work, I'd rather the discussions happen in a broad, open partnership way. Um, so I think that, that that's how we'll probably we'd prefer to, to have this dialogue and, um, and, and develop this as we go through. Very clear, Phil. So are there, are there any initial comments from um, any board members now on this paper, which was primarily there for information as an update, but just reflecting Phil's ask? I'm not, I'm not seeing any hands. Nikki. Um, thank you, Mark. I was just uh, considering um, the five sectors which are within the investment zone. I think quite a lot of regions are looking at these as well, um, particularly health and life sciences. Um, I'm just thinking, I've been to a lot of round tables about levelling up, and it just seems to be lots of areas are all doing the same thing. And it could be a bit of a race to the bottom if we're not careful, rather than sort of more horizon thinking about what we might go at. And I just wondered how much of this will be thought about from a northern perspective, rather than just from a West Yorkshire perspective, so that we are, we, we can't grow what's not there, but how, how do we ensure that we're not too much in competition, perhaps cannibalising the north in some ways by all going at the same areas? So it's a big question, Phil, my apologies, but... I'm just trying to think of a pan-northern approach to this. How, how might we decide what's a priority and, and what we go at? Thank you, Nikki. And, you know, the pan-regional approach is, is very much what not just the MP11, but also the Convention of the North is, is sort of trying to sort of bring across. So, Mayor, maybe I'd just yeah. bring you in to talk about the pan-regional. Just, just to reassure you, Nikki, that the mayors were in those early conversations discussing what they were going to prioritise. 
what was very interesting though was one of the one of the um, uh, missions from government was culture and creativity, and you can't make it work with the the structure of the investment zones. So we were we were challenged by government. Why aren't you doing creativity? It's like, well, you tell us how we're going to make it work then, because currently this is this is putting a a round ball in a square hole. So uh, we we were very mindful of what other MCAs were doing as well. To your point, we absolutely didn't want to all be doing health tech, because then where's your clustering and it won't um, appeal to government. So and bearing in mind it's over five years this money, so it's a long t it's a long haul. So it sounds like a lot, but over five years it sort of puts it into a little bit more perspective. Thanks, Phil. Councillor Hinchcliffe. Yeah, um, just sort of to re-emphasise the point really that um, this is a small amount of money and actually we'll do it our way, I think probably. So <laughs> we've got plans, we've got a deal of 1.6 billion, all it's less now with inflation. So actually we do need businesses and universities and local authorities to work more closely together to really power our economy. And anything we can get from government to enable us to do that, great, but we should have our own plans, our own vision and destination that's why the West Yorkshire plan is there to make sure we make things happen here and if we can use the investment zone initiative to help that then fine but we should be really clear about what what we need to do here and for me it is about making sure our universities are as close to our businesses as possible and that's where you get that magic of growth. Well, well said. <laughs> and investment zones are sort of one policy element that we can use but we have got a much broader uh, approach that will be in, in our economic strategy. Okay um, so I will move us now on to um, item number 11, which is committee updates. Um, can, can I suggest we've, we've got updates from each of the committees in the paper, but I will give the opportunity for either chairs or deputy chairs of the committees to give any updates by exception um, to, to that, because I think we can all read um, you know, what's in the paper. So if there's anything that's either happened since then um, or, or anything that doesn't uh, jump out from the paper, we, we should talk, but otherwise we'll, we'll move on. So on the Business, Economy and Innovation Committee, Councillor Pandora, is there anything further to add? So the last, the last BEAT committee um, covered a few things, some of which we've actually talked about in this meeting. So the first, the first one here was, um, you remember we'd been discussing the Northern Gritstone investment, the last um, BEAT committee discussed that 1.5 million Northern Gritstone investment, which we've now made. We also talked about, which we've reflected on earlier, the beginning of us developing an equality, diversity and inclusion strategy for the business support function, um, and which is going to be aligned to the wider work of the economic strategy. And um, we've the, the other two things are worth updating on are the fact we've provided um, the, the committee provided some feedback to um, the combined authorities approach to how we might do business support differently now that we've exited the EU and the restrictions are are different. It's about the types of businesses we can support. Um, and we're going to be having a further workshop to discuss that further with committee members. And then finally, we brought for the first time for a while um, the, the inward investment performance and um, began the work to develop the inward investment strategy about how we shape and direct our resources on inward investment going forward. Thank you, um, Phil, for that update. So on climate, energy and the environment, um, we, we met in March. I think the overall theme to say is we've, we've spent a, a few years perhaps discussing strategy and approach. Um, and now the committee is moving into decision making and approvals, which is really great to see. So there was an approval for just over £2 million of funding for Better Neighbourhoods programme, um, and then also a smaller amount, uh, £366,000, um, for a solar project to put uh, solar panels on seven of our combined authorities' bus stations, um, which I think is, yes, a small step, but a, but a demonstrable action um, that, that we're doing you know, to, to take this um, seriously. Um, if we move to culture, heritage and, and sports, Mayor, yeah. is there any further yeah. update? Um, no, but we didn't have a formal meeting, and thank you very much, Nikki, for loaning us that beautiful, the beautiful Peace Hall to have our, our, our meeting. And I was really um, thrilled to be able to have what felt like a bit of a task and finish group, you know, a, a, a moment where we could really discuss trailblazers, investment zones, our ambitions for the Northern Cultural Corridor, um, and to, to get a whole bunch of creatives, creative problem solving in a room. 
Um, so it was really well run by yourself. Thank you so much. Um, and the, the tasks that you gave us were also really good. Um, and I think uh, coming out of that, we've, we, we had some takeaways about um, uh, how we go to next steps around culture. Um, so it was, go it was good and I would encourage um, other committee chairs to move around the region because it was, it was interesting how even in the culture committee, there were people who'd never been to the Peace Hall. It's like, what, where have you been? Um, so I would encourage other committee chairs to move around as well. Oh, that's great, and a, and a great idea to, uh, to, to, to move around. Um, employment and skills, I don't think we have either the chair or vice chair here, but the, the committee met um, and, and considered reports on adult skills, green jobs, and future funding. Um, also, um, I, I think the Chambers of Commerce led a discussion on the LSIP, the Local Skill Improvement Plan, um, and just starting to think about how that ambition um, is, is sort of, we're progressing towards it and perhaps where, where we need to go um, further. Um, for place regeneration housing, Councillor Scullion. Um, thank you. I want to be congratulated, or this committee to be congratulated on that we managed to get two meetings in, actually, so good productivity of this committee. Um, just wanted to mention the strategic place partnership with Homes England, really crucial, pivotal moment in terms of different kinds of homes, affordable homes, um, for people, for people in West Yorkshire, really important. We also spent some time talking about local digital par partnerships and digital blueprint for West Yorkshire. But something that was a highlight that perhaps isn't mentioned uh, around this table very often is actually work that the combined authority and the districts were doing around dementia services, particularly in relation to housing. And we heard some lovely, inspiring stories about the kind of work given our ageing population of, of dementia relations, actually the ways in which the house in an inclusive way people suffering from dementia and their families really want to highlight that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for the have done on a management pledge homes of course work that of those two things together. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Beth. Um, I'm sure it means least. Transport. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, obviously, I have to take the report to Edrin. Obviously, we've done a lot on bus side, which obviously is challenging given government cuts. However, uh, I would like to focus just for the future onto the rail strategy as well, which we consulted on over the summer. We still have uh, very positive rail ambitions for the whole region. Um, obviously, we need to do some work uh, with government to make sure they share those. Uh, but um, uh, we, we definitely want to make sure we put our case well, and that rail strategy is going to be very much a part of conversations we have with Network Rail about prioritising investment, etc. So please do have a look at that when it comes. Um, also, um, uh, we um, announced this week it, that Rail North is going to be chaired uh, by Andy Burnham for the West Yorkshire Mayor, and I'm going to take on the role as Vice Chair for West Yorkshire, uh, which I think is, is a, a good cross northern approach to the committee and I'm very much looking forward to working with Andy Burnham and the committee. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Hinship and having had the pleasure of sitting on Transport for the North for a, for a few years I, I know how you know much investment and progress we need on that agenda. I'm delighted to see you appointed as Deputy Chair and, and, and working to, to make something happen on that important trans trans line via Bradford. Um, so great. Okay, that's that paper. The last um, substantive paper that we have on our agenda is on the West Yorkshire plan, um, item 12. Um, we, we've been referencing this throughout uh, the meeting. Um, I think, you know, this is seen as a shared vision and narrative primarily for um, us to talk to government and to talk to regional partners about. It's already been approved by the CA uh, in May. Um, it's launching this Friday, and we're, we're just being asked to endorse this. But, Alan, w would you like to add anything further to, uh, to that? Because I know we've, we've discussed it previously. Uh, I probably don't have, in, don't have much to, to add. It's already been discussed here, um, and it was discussed in draft by all of the CA committees, and we had a wide range of input from stakeholders uh, across the region over the last 
uh, few months, and Tom mentioned earlier the State of the Region uh, re annual report that we produce. Um, because clearly one of, one of the questions being, okay, we've set ourselves some missions, how are we now going to measure ourselves against them? And the intention will be that the State of the Region report is used uh, as an annual kind of stock take of where we are against each of the missions. Um, but otherwise, uh, uh, would like to see the board, board's endorsement of the West Yorkshire Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And are there any comments or questions for Alan on the West Yorkshire Plan? Barney. And I, I felt it was going, going so well in my first meeting in that. But when we met the, on, uh, with the other business, we were all a bit surprised to see it completed already because we were involved in very early discussions and then we were told at some point we'll come back and have another look at it and suddenly it's, it's, it's appeared. And, and I don't think we, we, we looked in and thought there's, there's much in it we would, would change or don't agree with, but we just are, are con concerned that we didn't get the chance to, to feed in in the way we would normally have. Uh, and we, I know it's been a real time of change and everything's up in the air at the minute, but I think, you know, I just, I just hope in future that there's better uh, work with all the different stakeholders and we get more of a chance to say, even if we don't say anything interesting, having the chance to say, it, I think it's quite important and challenging orthodoxies and challenging thoughts. So there's anything. And if I'd make one substantive point on it, I, I just would also like to say, with the missions, I think we really need to be careful. We don't separate sustainability and the environment from the economy, because if it's not, if if, if it, anything we do in, in the economy, if it isn't sustainably better than what went before it, why are we supporting it? Why do we want it? Unless, a, you know, we, we need to think if there is a reason to to do that. So that was my point. Th thank you, Barney. And um, on on your substantive point, um, I, I've been mentioning very similar things. It's, it's not just about sustainability on the economy, but it's also about a better economy has other inputs on safety, um, on health. Uh, so so it is entirely uh, linked. But I entirely agree with sustainability. I, th I think on the point of engagement, I, I know officers have been sort of trying. I, I would maybe just like to highlight there was one business rep groups meeting that we were due to have, but I think train strikes got in the way of, um, and there were a couple of other things. So so I think you know on behalf of mm. Of, of us, I think, I think there are some apologies there on, on, on the engagement, but a note that we want to, of course, engage our business rep groups, and we very much look forward to you to being part of that, and, and I think importantly developing that economic strategy beyond mission one. Yeah, it's always been good in, in the past. I, I'm, I'm sure it's one of them things, but it's just important to note that when it does go wrong, or, or not wrong, but we're not happy, we don't sit and say, oh, that's a, we do say we're not happy with how it's gone this time, but so let's make sure we don't do it again. You know, and it's up to us as well, you know, if we don't turn up to meetings, then it's our fault as well. It's not one way this. Excellent. Noted. <laughs> Super. Um, okay, any other points on West Yorkshire Plan? No, so that concludes the, the main meeting. We've got in the pack for information draft minutes from the combined authority held on the um, 16th of March. And, and then we've got the date for the next meeting, um, the next formal meeting, I, I should now say, in public on the 29th of November. Um, but, but I think there, we have an action for the, the next meeting that will be held in a more sort of informal discussive setting, probably somewhere different to um, Wellington House to be happening in September. So um, j just once again, thank you very much for not just today, um, but for, you know, helping shape, you know, the LEP agenda. You know, for me over the last sort of six years, it's been a real... Um, pleasure to be part of it um, and I hope we can now all go a little early and enjoy some sunshine to finish us off so um, thanks everyone Thank you.